We have a, an exciting announcement that we'll be sharing with you shortly. We have some special guests who will be joining us who are about to enter the auditorium. And as they do, we will introduce them and explain why we're really excited to have them. But thank you to all of you who are joining us here in person and on Facebook Live for this event where we're going to have a conversation about slavery and Walford's history. The title of tonight's presentation is The Part of Us They Could See, The Part of Us They Could Not. And so part of what we are going to do tonight is we are going to try to have a conversation about something that is roiling the entire nation. We have a number of institutions, a number of states that are trying to address the question of how they should respond to slavery, how they should respond to a history of anti-black violence, and how we should hopefully memorialize these events in our history. So we are looking forward to having a conversation. But before we do that, I would like to share with you all why we're starting just a little late. We just benefited from a special presentation from our guests this evening. We have been very fortunate to receive what I thought were, would be two gifts from the Cheek Fant family, and in fact, we have now received three. So we are excited to have them join us. And um, what I'd like to do before we begin tonight's conversation is I do have the honor of recognizing the generosity of the Cheek Fant family. Um, earlier tonight, we received a very kind offer from them. So would you all like to join us up here, or would you like to stay seated? <laughs> you like to stay seated. Honest people, I appreciate it. But here with us tonight are um, Mrs. Myrtle Cheek, who I am ashamed to admit I've known James Cheek for 25 years and did not realize that his mother taught me math a, more, a, lot, a lot longer ago than I care to remember. Uh, Mr. James Cheek, class of 1973. Mrs. Marjorie Fant, his sister and wife of Mr. Philip Fant, class of 1974. And their daughter, Miss Felicia Fant, and uh, Ms. Annalisa Finch from our advancement office. We have received, as I indicated, three awards from them tonight. The first, uh, Mr. Cheek and Mr. Fant were um, the first, among the first cohort of African American students to integrate Wofford College. Since their graduation, each has been a faithful friend to Wofford College. And tonight, um, Ms. Felicia Fant, um, their daughter and um, niece respectively, have has established the Philip E. Fant and James A. Cheek Endowed Scholarship in honor of her father and her uncle. Uh, Mr. Cheek and his sister have established the Mr. Arthur Earl Cheek and Mrs. Myrtle Cheek Endowed Scholarship, which will be a high impact endowed scholarship that will provide study abroad opportunities for African American and other first generation college students. And I am pleased to announce that the Fan family has given us a, an award towards a travel fund for work that my office will be doing trying to help students experience um, to travel to civil rights museums and other sites that will engage with diversity initiatives. So again, we would like to thank them for their generosity. Earlier, <laughs> we wanted to make time for the family to offer any remarks. Did you have any remarks that you wish to make? Silence is gold. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> But again, we do thank them for their generosity. So I will now give you a little bit about what we are going to do here tonight. Uh, tonight's conversation will focus on Walford staff and students' efforts to increase awareness of the college's historic ties to African enslavement, especially since the events of 2020, and conversations on campus about how we were to respond to the fact that three dorms on campus are named for persons whom we know to have held African slaves. So we will review what recent student-led research has contributed to what we know about slavery in Walford's history, about the construction of the original campus, and also about slave ownership by Walford's original faculty and trustees. And then finally, again, we will start to ask questions about how should we respond to the historical legacy of slavery and the fact, again, that we have dorms on campus that are named for persons that we know to have been enslavers. I want to do a very quick run through of what we know to this point and the efforts that have been done to address this heritage before I invite our panelists to join us. The first steps in this process began during the renovation of Old Main in 2007, 2008, when our campus chaplain, Ron Robinson, realized this was an excellent opportunity in the renovation for us to memorialize the, the 11 slaves whom we know to have worked on main building. So if you go into the basement of the main building, you will find the original, some of the original brickwork exposed 
And Nikki Finney wrote a poem called The Thinking Man. And we are willing to share this presentation with anyone who would like to see it. This hyperlink then takes you to the text of this poem, which we will also feature at the end of this presentation. But this was the first of a series of efforts designed to recognize the fact that enslaved persons were central to the construction of our main building and to the original faculty homes on campus. Between 2010 and 2013, two of our colleagues here, uh, who will talk about their work later on, participated in a, two exhibits that were designed to, to highlight the African American experience at Wofford and the slave experience at Wofford. In 2010, we had an exhibition that talked about slavery at Wofford. Unfortunately, that is not available in our digital commons, but you can read about it if you go to this link on our archivist's blog. And if you would like to see the 2013 exhibit on desegregation, that is available online and anyone can consult it at that link. So at least since 2007, the college has been slowly but surely attempting to address these issues, to put this information into the public sphere. And then in 2020, in the wake of the events surrounding George Floyd and, and renewed awareness of and concern about African American violence against African Americans, the legacy of slavery, a group of our research students, a group of our undergraduate students rather, working from a, a CIC grant in partnership with a faculty member, began doing research in Spartanburg's history, in Walford's history, the experience of African Americans on our campus, and they produced a report known as Acknowledging Our Past. We're going to walk through that in just a second, but if anyone would like to read this document in its entirety, this document is available at our digital commons, and for anyone who is here tonight, we do have physical copies that you're welcome to pick up, because we do want for people to read this document. It represents significant hard work by a group of dedicated undergraduates who wanted for us to engage with Wofford's past. So quickly, here's the document, Acknowledging Our Past, Race, Landscape, and History, and Aaliyah Harris, Keisha, uh, Keisha Bess, Deere McGowan, Destiny Shippey, Vera Oberg, Bryson Coleman, Luke Marr, and Rhiannon Liebrick worked to update our knowledge of slavery and the, of, and the experience of African Americans on this campus. Uh, this information was included in histories of the college from the 1950s. It's, it's featured in, in various newspaper stories, but the story had simply disappeared. It's not commonly featured in our narrative. And this timeline establishes the work that was done during the spring of 2020 as the students learned how to do oral history, how to do archival research, and in so doing, ended up producing this report. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to a couple of the research goals. To better understand the history of anti-black racism and the various manifestations on our college's campus, to explore what history has been preserved and how it has been told and what has been minimized, ignored, or left out of the historical narrative about our school. And those are the two goals that we're going to focus on here. This is a much broader survey. We owe a great deal to these students of, re of reviving this conversation, but for our purposes, we're only focusing on slavery and the slave experience, so we're only going to focus on those first two research goals. Guiding research questions then, how did Wofford College and its early stakeholders support and particip participate in slavery? How is the legacy of slavery present in the landscape of our campus, buildings, statues, or names? And how can we better understand Wofford as an institution during the time of Reconstruction through the Jim Crow era? Our goal here tonight is simply to present, beginning with this document, what we know about slavery at Wofford and what research is ongoing, and then to engage with the question again, how should we wrestle with the fact that we do have spaces named for persons who signed the Ordinance of Secession and who were active, actively held slaves. Major findings here are, out, are laid out very quickly. Archival data show that early Wofford leaders, like many of their peers and other academic institutions, were pro-slavery in their written work and speeches and had ties to well-known anti-abolitionist and pro-slavery leaders. Many early Wofford leaders were slave owners, including college founder Benjamin Wofford and presidents Whiteman, Ship, and Carlisle, as well as members of the early Board of Trustees and some early faculty. As you hear tonight, all of the original Wofford faculty, in fact, owned slaves. We have done subsequent research to verify that. Uh, Walford's earliest buildings, Maine and the five original faculty houses, were constructed by enslaved people. And again, given our narrow focus on slavery tonight, those are the findings that we're going to be having a conversation about to make sure that everyone has the same factual basis. It is concerning to us that people may not know all that they need to know, so we want to make sure that we have a, a common set of facts so we can have a meaningful conversation. 
So with that having been said, I invite our panelists to join us. They seem surprised that I invited them. <laughs> As they're coming down, I will introduce our panelists. First is Dr. Tracy Revels, professor of history and uh, second or third longest tenured faculty member now. Uh, Dr. Philip Stone is the college's archivist and he is one of our primary academic leaders in historical research. Next to him is, Dr. is Professor Luke Marr. He is our special collection and research librarian. And rounding out the table is Dr. Ken Banks, who is our, an associate professor of history. He teaches our courses on slavery and the Atlantic world. What we've attempted to do is to assemble our campus experts so that we can have a conversation about what we know about slavery, what we know about Wofford, and again, next directions and next steps. For those of you who are watching on Facebook, please, if you have questions, feel free to submit them through Facebook. We will be happy to answer those uh, as they come in. And again, for anyone here, we will encourage you to participate actively as well. So this presentation is designed to function around five core questions. The first core question, where we're going to start with Dr. Banks here, is how is slavery most commonly misunderstood? We want to talk about what people think they know versus what historians have established in academic literature. So Dr. Banks, we'll get you started with you. How would you say slavery is most commonly misunderstood? I would say that there are about three major areas. The first is how people go from being people to being an object. And I think that's absolutely the most crucial foundational element. A lot of people really don't have a clear idea, not only in this country, but in any place, certainly that I've taught in, where they understand just what that actually means and the heritage of what that means. So that's the first thing. The second thing, I think it's very important is to understand how there are different elements of enslavement that are around the globe, that there are different geographical regions, that the impact that it has had in the area of the African diaspora just itself, not only in the Americas, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And the third area that I think is not really, really fully understood is the differences of the of enslavement, the types that change and mutate through the, the, the years. And I do want to emphasize chattel slavery, chattel enslavement, as probably the most virulent form. Okay, thank you. Would any of the rest of my historian colleagues like to offer insights? What do students misunderstand most about slavery? Um, I'll take that one. Um, one of, there's two things that I feel like students often come in with. One is a kind of a, romanti a romanticized view of slavery because they've seen Gone with the Wind or they've seen some other sort of lost cause, Moonlight and Magnolia interpretation. And that's very unfortunate. And you have to work really hard sometimes with students to say, no, no, no. You know, slavery was a very bad thing. Okay, it's not a benign institution. It was a very cruel, unjust, and as my colleague says, evil institution. So you really have to work hard with some students to get them to understand that. And that's a very unfortunate thing. It comes a lot out of our culture. Another thing is just getting students to understand that it's important to study slavery. It's not something you can do 30 minutes in a class and then put it in a box and walk away from it. It's part of the American story, the American experience. We have to see how it's threaded through everything in American history. And I'm always talking about the long shadow of history, which you need to be able to see things that happened 200 years ago still have impacts on us today, even though slavery doesn't exist. Certain attitudes still exist. So those are things that I'm always working with my class to try to help them understand. Any, uh, Luke or Philip? Yeah. One of the things that we added, I want to make sure, we, we were talking about this as a group, and there were some things that we discussed that we didn't want to run through that we think are common misunderstandings. Number one, that the enslaved had rights. Two, that enslavement has never been viewed as being morally acceptable. That slavery is an economically inefficient system. In fact, if you read some of the more recent scholarship, we talk about just how central it was to the development of the modern capitalist economy, and how it's central to the development of the, of the, of the 19th century industrial sector. Uh, the United States was the largest enslaving society, that we have no idea how many people ultimately were enslaved. 
and that slaves owned in South Carolina, to focus more narrowly, could legally emancipate their slaves at any time throughout slavery's history. Because this comes back later for us when we're talking about slavery at Waffle. We'll talk about that in just a second. And that finally, enslaved, the enslaved resistance to slavery was rare. Here are just a couple of things that we pulled from local newspapers. This is Carolina Spartan from November 1st of 1860. I know that you really won't be able to read this, but this is an incredible document from the New York Herald that spends a great deal of time arguing for the morality of the slave trade. Slavery was the beginning of civilization in a savage state where the only means of a of, a, of sustenance was, were derived from the chase. Prisoners taken in, uh, could not be supported. Their captors possessed no means for feeding or maintaining them. Hence, their constant custom was to put them to death, skipping down. Hence, when savage chiefs found they could sell their prisoners to those able and willing to feed them for their services, the spirit of civilization stepped in and rescued them from death. See, it was a good thing. Beneficial. Skipping down. Um, Let's see. African labor in the New World, this is the last full paragraph, has formed one of the most remarkable epochs in the history of man. In no period of his previous existence were Africans subjected to tropical labor. In no part of the Eastern world did, the, um, did such a vast rich field exist for its employment. Thank you. <laughs> and this is the end of that article, again, from Sparmark Herald. In November 1860, you see a well-dressed Negro walking the streets about as well civilized as his nature permits. How do he attain that civilization? Does somebody send to Africa and bring him over, rear feed and clothe him at their expense in order to civilize him? No, he was civilized by the services of his ancestor, without which, if he now existed at all, he would be a pig-headed cannibal in the wilds of Africa. I always recommend to people who want to study slavery, read the primary source documents, see what people actually said. Again, for those of you who have not studied slavery, we tend to think that the United States is the central location to which slaves were sent. As this helpful chart points out, if you look at the number of slaves going to Brazil, the numbers going to the Caribbean, and then look at the numbers of actually came to Britain, North America, we are looking at a significantly different portrait of slavery than most people actually can, uh, understand. But this is something that we want to underscore because this will become important later for our conversation about our slave holding presidents and faculty members. In 1820, an act to restrain the emancipation of slaves and to prevent free persons of color from entering this state outlawed private manumission in South Carolina. From January of 1821 forward, the only way an enslaved person could be emancipated would be if the state legislature approved it which made it effectively impossible to emancipate a slave in the state of South Carolina from 1821 until 1865. Question number two. I just think this is funny when we talk about resistance. I stumbled across these. Uh, the best $75 I've spent in a long time is getting a subscription to newspapers.com. But in looking for information about Spartanburg and slavery, I stumbled across two attempts by Spartanburg slaves to murder their owners. This appeared in, in The Liberator, the famous abolitionist newspaper in May of 14, 1831. The North Carolina Spectator states that in Spartanburg, South Carolina, Mr. Woodruff, Mr. Caleb Woodruff, started to visit his father-in-law, Mr. Dean, who was sick. He was waylaid by five of Mr. Dean's Negroes and killed. The cause was said to be they feared to become the property of Mr. W on the death of Mr. D. Which gives you some sense of the agency that slaves could actually have, that they understood that their lot, their lot could be a lot worse. The second story from 1864, the Civil War is about to end, is actually kind of interesting. We are pained to learn that Mr. Richard M. Smith, a highly respected and intelligent citizen of the lower part of our district, was inhumanely murdered while in his bed by his own slave on Saturday morning last. His death was produced by a violent blow on the head with a billet of wood. The murderer, after perpetuating the deed, fired the bed and thereafter the, the, uh, the house. So it's an interesting story, nevertheless. So even if you, as we're looking at the history of slavery in Spartanburg, we can find evidence of interesting forms of resistance. Question number two, what do we know about slavery and enslaved persons in the 1850s? I will start with my friend, the South Carolina historian, Dr. Stone. Well, one thing I do uh, like to point out is that slavery was, South Carolina was not a, was a slave society. Slavery was, a part of, of the politics, the economics, the society, the culture of South Carolina, the religion of South Carolina. Uh, in fact, the religion of the, all the Protestant denominations in South Carolina by 1860 
any, any history that they ever had of being anti-slavery was, was gone. Um, it, it's interesting with the Methodists, which is the, the tradition I know the most about, uh, the Methodist Church was largely, uh, probably had more enslaved members than most of the other Protestant denominations in South Carolina. And, and yet, um, all of those Methodist leaders had, had become uh, pro-slavery and defended slavery as a positive good. Uh, Spartanburg in, 18, in between 1850 and 1860, Spartanburg grew a great deal. Uh, the railroad came to Spartanburg in the 1850s. A college opened in Spartanburg in the 1850s. Uh, by 1859, we were sort of the end of the rail line. In 1860, there were 26,000 people in Spartanburg County, which was even a little bit of a larger county than it is today, uh, because a lot of what's now in Cherokee County was in Spartanburg. Uh, we had a courthouse village, probably I think about 1,500 or so people in the village. That 26,000 people in the county is less than what's in just the city today. So it's a, still a pretty sparsely populated area. Of those 26,000 people, about 18,000 were white and about 8,000 were enslaved persons. So about a third of the population of Spartanburg, of Spartanburg district, was, was enslaved. That's not nearly the ratio that you would have had in a plantation parish, in a, in a, in a coastal uh, county, a coastal parish, but you would have had, a, most anyone in Spartanburg would have known, uh, known of slavery, would have known someone who owned a slave, even if they didn't themselves. Um, Dr. Revels could help me out here. I think we usually think of a large slaveholder as being someone who owned more than 20, and 5 to 20 is usually in the middle. Um, and there were a, a handful, a pretty good handful of large slaveholders. I think there were at least some people even who owned more than 50 slaves in the lower portion of Spartanburg County, um, along the river bottoms. We didn't grow much cotton in Spartanburg County. Spartanburg County's planters didn't grow much cotton before the war, uh, before the Civil War. It was only afterwards that you end up with sharecropping and, and the cotton becomes endemic in this area. Um, so that's that's probably more than anybody wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, so who would have owned slaves? Uh, pretty much anybody, I think. Okay. It would be sort of a middle class marker in a way, right? To I own think an so. Enslaved person, and even if your family didn't, own, and you were a white family, didn't own enslaved people, you knew people who did. You were related to people who did. You did business with people who did. This is what we mean when we use the phrase slave society, mm -hmm. that every white person is, whether they own an enslaved person or not, they're still caught up in that and they benefit from, mm -hmm. from that, assuming that being their weapon. Yeah, quoted from historian Diane Vecchio, who wrote about Spartanburg, uh, the summit of Spartanburg in the 1850s. Within Spartanburg Village, there was a growing professional class of lawyers, merchants, industrialists, and entrepreneurial farmers to work, prim uh, to work primarily as house servants, so that there was a large number of people who, as, again, as a middle class marker, they were the ones purchasing slaves, but they wanted them to serve as house servants. This is something, again, that I pulled from the newspaper that I just think is kind of interesting. This tells you about, I think it suggests something about where slavery was in Spartanburg County in 1857. This is a city ordinance from 1857. Slaves are prevented, prevented from selling goods on Sundays without a permit, or they'll be arrested. You can't buy goods from another slave if you are a slave, or you're subject to be arrested. If you are not a slave, but you buy something from a slave, you're subject to a fine. But if you are a slave who is found walking with a cane, smoking cigars, or otherwise putting on airs, you're going to be whipped 25 lashes. In our question and answer, I want, we can come back to this, but I want you to think about what does that tell you about fears of or thoughts about the black population in Spartanburg in 1857? What are people concerned about black people doing, or slaves doing rather, in this time period? Question three, and we're going to start with Luke here. How did the Acknowledging Our Past researchers reconstruct slavery's role in Walford's history? We want to talk about the process by which we uncover evidence of our historical past. What kind of sources are available to do this? What kind of research, uh, what, and what, uh, to do this kind of research, and what are the limitations of that kind of research? Sure, so uh, I'll, uh, Philip and I worked with this uh, granting, uh, with this group of students to do this research. Um, 
myself on the kind of librarian and archival side, and Philip as the steward of both the Methodist records and the, and the college's permanently valuable records. So we really knew that, that those records would be the, where we would be starting with uh, early trustees' records, early faculty members' uh, records, early presidents' records, and then there's also a pretty good secondary history uh, about uh, about Wofford, uh, written at a couple different times during its history. Um, so those are the main sources. We have all these these papers that have been with the college for this Just long. Just to confirm, and you'd then, like to call Tammy Gallant. Um, there's also Board of Tr Trustees minutes, I think, as well, mm -hmm. right? Hey, Tammy. And things like that. <laughs> 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 so. Um, Mainly the permanently valuable records of the college, but at the same time, the Methodist records were related because of, uh, say, prominence of early faculty and, and administrators in the Methodist um, conference. Is that right? Yeah. Would you add any more to that? Uh, we looked at uh, the students, and Luke and I looked at treasurer's books and found what we could find. Uh, Luke made a, a discovery in, the, in looking at the treasurer's books to find when the college used some of its resources to pay the college. The faculty member who's the treasurer paid for uh, the use of one of the faculty members and slave people. Um, we, yeah, we, we used uh, the, the Advocate, the Methodist newspaper in South Carolina, uh, trustee minutes, uh, vertical fi subject files, basically, that, that my predecessor and I have kept on some of those founding generation of faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, in that picture, there's that, that, that early document, some early construction records having to do with the, with the construction of Old Main. Um, we went back and tried to find out some things about uh, the labor, uh, the thinking men, really, about, about when Old Main was built, mm -hmm. um, and those other, those other um, structures. And you actually raised the question I was hoping we could get at. What do we know about the slaves who were owned the, the, as human beings? What can we know about them based on the records that we have? And, and that is way harder than a lot of people think it is because um, we, between actually the people sitting here in the front of the room, uh, Luke and I have each sort of uncovered at least one of those original faculty members. Dr. Pruitt uncovered one of them, the last one that we couldn't find. Um, you have to often go to the schedule, of, the census of slaves, the slave schedule in the U.S. Census. Every 10 years when the federal government takes the census, before 1870 they would enumerate how many enslaved persons, but they never listed anybody's name. All it is is the owner, the age and sex of the enslaved person, um, and you can make some educated guesses about some things. Sometimes they'd have a little bit of additional information. And so, and, and not all of those original faculty were living in Spartanburg or owned enslaved people in Spartanburg in 1860. So we had to get a little clever. Um, when we found uh, the document uh, that talks about Nancy, the enslaved woman that, that was owned by President Carlisle, Professor Carlisle at that point. Um, that led me to the county library to try to find Nancy. She doesn't show up in 1860. Uh, so that's a question for a little bit later. But that, in finding, in looking for Nancy, I've discovered President Shipp uh, owned a substantial number, uh, a number that I, I will tell everyone I nearly fell out of my chair because I never expected a, a Methodist minister and college faculty member to have owned 22 enslaved persons of varying ages. It looks like it was probably a few families. Mm -hmm. um, that led us to try to find President Whiteman, the first president. He was already in Greene County, Alabama in 1860. Luke found him in the Alabama sch schedules, I believe. And then we went back looking for Warren Dupree, um, David Duncan, um, and then finally, Dwayne actually found Whiteford Smith, um, who was actually had his enslaved persons were in Greenville County for some reason. And note for amateur historians, expect people to misspell names. I found out oh, yeah. his name was misspelled. Of, which you would expect Whiteford Smith. And Whiteford Smith has two O's in it, not one. So mm -hmm. the, the census taker didn't know that. So that's how I found it. I, I put this, I paired this with this image just because this is hilarious. One of the students is talking about doing archival, archival research. 
Based on some of the findings that I've discovered, I now understand how tedious archival research is and how limited archival research can be. There were certain parts of Walford history that I wanted to study, but was, I was unable to because there's not enough information on it, and it frustrates me that there are so many holes that may <clears> never <throat> be filled. And that is indeed the curse of the professional historian. And I, Go ahead, sorry. And I was going to say, and I, I'm going to defer to Dr. Rebels here as well, but um, I, I mean, that's something we would all love to have found that Dr. Carlisle kept a journal or something, or talked about letters. But the thing I think I'd say, and I'll see if you agree, it was so ubiquitous that nobody even bothered to write it down. Right. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't think about it. it. It didn't, I don't want to say it didn't matter, but it was just such a part of their lives. They, they didn't put it down. And are we going to the Nancy? No, that, that's 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 Well, we're almost there. OK, all right. Four out of five. About Nancy. May I add something? Yes, please, please. feel free. Uh, the thinking men, um, I think that was a, you know, a central question that we were, we were coming to at the, at the, in that research process. And it tr proved to be tricky because um, uh, the, the builder, we know that the builder owned several enslaved people and uh, also had Freeman working for him. And then it's possible, or I suppose likely, that he might have uh, rented local labor and so um, that's that's essentially what we know they may or may not or, or, or both may, may have both been from here and from the, the Asheville area. Dr. Banks? I just want to observe that this inability to find people in the records is exactly why enslavement is so insidious that mm -hmm. is yeah. what we're looking at, your objects. That's how they're viewed. That's how people are viewed. You don't need to list an object mm -hmm. in any detail. And I'll add that this is a, a kind of a recognized phenomenon now in archival and libraries, mm -hmm. li library studies. It's called an archival science. Where, uh, uh, sorry, ex excuse me. It's called an archival silence, where evidence, written evidence that you would expect to be in the written record is is, is not available, and I, and I know I'm sure that um, I've run into it in my, plat in my work, and I think, it, I'm sure, I'm almost certain that black people in America trying to do genealogical research um, really hit this wall uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and it's, that in itself is, is, a, is, a, is a tragic and mm -hmm. ongoing emotional trauma, I think. Um, but. Uh, that's also what I liked about De'Aaron's quote, you know, and uh, uh, working with her, she was an inspiration in terms of her, you know, she was really dedicated to seeking the truth, and that, I, I really admired that. And um, yeah, I thought that she really did a great job in, in that, um, explaining some of the, the tedium, but also the frustration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've already started addressing our fourth question. So what do we know about the, the person, about Reverend Benjamin Walford and Walford's original faculty members and trustees? So we'll take this in order. Uh, who wants to talk about the Reverend Walford? What do we know about Benjamin Walford and slavery? So uh, Benjamin Walford was a Methodist minister. He married well, and his first, and, and when he married his first wife, Anna Todd, she was the only daughter, the only child of one of the wealthiest landowners in Southern Spartanburg County. Um, actually, one of the things, occasionally I'm still finding new things in the collection. Uh, Dwayne, Dr. Pruitt and I actually came across just this past fall in looking at some of the Walford papers, we came across where Thomas Todd, in his estate file, there are 11 enslaved persons that would have been bequeathed to, to Anna Todd Walford. Um, he and, and his family, they, they stayed out in the county through the 1830s. After Anna Todd Walford died, he remarried and moved into the village. In his will, he bequeathed eight enslaved persons to different individuals. And we also have some record, and I'm, I'm blanking on some of the details, but where one of his enslaved people was accused of a crime, and one of the few letters that we have, that uh, we've heard of in Benjamin Walford's handwriting, is where he wrote to kind of protest of uh, the potential execution of one of his enslaved men. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do know that he, uh, he certainly did not manumit any of his slaves for reasons that we've already seen. 
uh, and nor in his will or in his will did he manumit anyone. Um, he bequeathed them to other family members. And why did he leave the Western Conference? When he was traveling in the early 1800s and first seeking admission to the Methodist ministry, each Methodist conference could decide for itself whether it would ordain slaveholders. And the Western Conference in Tennessee would not. So he was not ordained there. He came back to South Carolina and a few years later was ordained and served churches, served circuits for about three years. And then after um, Thomas and Ann Todd both died and he and Anna Todd had a, a farm to run, he stopped being a traveling minister. William Whiteman. I think I'm on the hot seat for all of this. Um, William Whiteman was also a Methodist minister. He, would, he was really the leading Methodist clergyman in antebellum South Carolina. He uh, was a Charlestonian, graduated from the College of Charleston. I found his valedictory address from the College of Charleston in, the papers one, in, the, in his papers at one point. Um, was involved with Randolph-Macon College. In fact, Benjamin Walford donated to Randolph-Macon College. Uh, Whiteman uh, was the, then became the editor of the Methodist Advocate after, uh, at some point after it was founded. And by 1851 was, was living in Charleston and was one of the named trustees. When Benjamin Walford wrote his will, he named 13 original trustees. One of the first one named was William Whiteman. Whiteman gave the cornerstone laying address on July 4th, 1851. And then, um, and, and then was the chairman of the board, the chairperson of the board of trustees, and then the trustees elected him to be the first president of the college and professor of what they called mental and moral philosophy, uh, which I take to mean religion. Uh, he was here for five years as president, and then in 1859 he left to become president of Southern University in Greensboro, Alabama, which is now part of Birmingham Southern. In 1866 he became a Methodist bishop. Uh, and, and came back to South Carolina. Uh, he owned, I believe, either nine, in 1860, nine, nine enslaved persons in Greene County, Alabama. The picture on the far end there, those, that's the Walford faculty photo from 1872, if memory serves, that those gentlemen would have been on the faculty throughout, throughout the 1860s. And each of the individuals there, with the possible exception of Lester's, I don't think, I don't remember seeing his name on anything, each of those gentlemen there would have owned someone who was enslaved. We're not going to focus on each of them. We've already mentioned the fact that the student research and our subsequent research has demonstrated that they held enslaved persons. Instead, we want to focus on President Ship and President Carlisle, just to move us along. Uh, that's President Albert Ship. President Ship married well. He married a woman from a Rose Hill Plantation in Marlboro County, and with those slaves, came, with her, that marriage, came her family's but, um, slaves from her family. And this is a common way, for, again, for Methodist ministers to acquire enslaved property, they inherited them. But for those of you who are from Spartanburg, he is probably most associated with Tobe Hartwell who was his enslaved person. And according to tradition, uh, President Ship took an interest in him, thought he was particularly intelligent, and taught him to read, and thus set him on his, uh, sort of on that direction to become a, a preeminent citizen in Spartanburg. Um, I'm also, this is something that Dr. Stone shared with me. If you go through the WPA narratives, there's actually a double WPA narrative from Nina Scott, described as Aunt Nina in 1937, so she'd have been in her late 70s, and she describes having been the enslaved person of presidentship. And we can certainly go through this later if we have, if we would like to, but I'll just start saying she's a very young child, but this does tell you something about how slaves responded to emancipation when she says that uh, my master is supposed to not treat me poor, they didn't treat him poorly, treat me like they did the other white folks, but again, she's a child. So uh, she said that she and her mother belonged to Dr. Ship, who taught at Walker College. They had come from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. In slavery days, they had two nurses, one for small children, one for the older ones. Yes, sir, those were fine people that lived on the campus during those days. And that's an interesting question for us. What interaction did the enslaved persons have with the Wofford community? Because as we've discussed, these people owned slaves. Our big question is where did they live? What did they do? Uh, we have evidence of one person being providing labor on the campus, but what did the rest of these enslaved persons do? And that's what we're sort of trying to figure out next. 
We can certainly come back to that later if we need to. Last question, because Dr. Revels mentioned this, and I want to make sure we get close to time. Why is Dr. Carlisle's enslavement of Nancy an interesting historical mystery? And we'll start with Dr. Revels. But this is the document that is at the center of much of our historical controversy. Now, this is the only evidence we have of a life right here. We don't know anything else about Nancy. We know who Dr. Carlisle purchased her from, and Dr. Pruitt has done some amazing work in tracking that individual down. We know roughly Nancy's age, and we know how much uh, Professor Carlisle paid for, which was a very low price, actually, at that time. Now, again, she is a much older woman. She has um, the average life expectancy is only around 30, maybe, for enslaved women, so she would be an elder. Wow. But we don't see her again. She doesn't show up in the slave census in 1860. So our big question is, what happened to her? Where did she go? Did she simply die very soon after she was purchased? Was she sold to someone else? We don't know. It's part of what's so heartbreaking about this story, is to just have her name. As far as we know, we have no evidence that Carlisle had any more enslaved people. This is the only person we know of. And it points out the sort of the, the frustrations of, of wanting to know more about the story, but you know, at, at least we have her name. I think we, we're grateful that we have Nancy's name. But we hope in some point, maybe we'll know more. And let me just conclude by saying, this is where historians, if we can't ever find any more about Nancy personally, there's a lot of really good work that has come out in the last 40 years on the life experiences of enslaved women. And so we have to look at that and we have to say, what would women of her age, maybe women in South Carolina, what might they have gone through? We can extrapolate a bit from that, but it's really hard to know Nancy. And this is all we have right here. Um, a couple things about this, because this actually has become something of an obsession of mine, I will confess. I spent, I've gone down lots of rabbit holes. Uh, my first question was the person who actually sold the slave. Uh, the slave. We thought that person's name was E.M. Edwards. We just thought that was something of an affectation. His last name is actually Edwardy. His last name is Edwardy because he anglicized a Hungarian name. And when I found that out, I actually tracked down his son, and we were actually able to track him through various things. And we discovered his wife's name. Now, you would not think that a Hungarian, he is a, mu a musician. You wouldn't think that a Hungarian musician would have a slave. So we try to figure out who he married. He married a woman in Charleston in 1852. There are four women named Mary Matthews who are the exact age who could be his wife. And so we're trying to figure out which one he married because one of them is a mulatto woman who had enslaved relatives in her family. And so my supposition, well, my, my, not my supposition, my, my question is, this, was this woman actually the relative of Mary Matthews Edwardy and was she left in Spartanburg because the family moved to New York and they couldn't take her? Or who, who might Mary Matthews be? Because that's gonna, that actually to me is going to be the answer to the question of who Nancy was. What woman, which enslaved 50 year old woman that I found in that year is actually going to be Nancy? Because I found four women who could be Nancy who were in, in Charleston at the right time. So I am determined I'm going to find this answer. I've become obsessed. I confess. Okay. Oh, uh, quick question. Dr. Carl on the Ordinance of Secession. Uh, so in 1860, uh, each county in South Carolina, after the election of President Lincoln, uh, the legislature met, called a secession convention. Each county was, was uh, invited to send delegates. Dr. Carlisle, who was all of 35 years old, had been here for six years. He, along with one of our trustees, Simpson Bobo, were both elected sort of by acclamation at a community meeting to be among the delegates. Dr. Carlisle actually voted against <coughs> secession. Uh, and I had forgotten that. I had to be reminded of that. He voted against it. However, in the way that everyone, that, that often happened in these situations, 
everyone signed the Ordinance of Secession, and in the archives we have his original lithograph copy of the Ordinance of Secession with all of the all of the signatures on it. So he, Carlisle also served in the legislature for a year or so during the during the Civil War. Um, when the war ended, um, he he went and took the loyalty oath fairly quickly, and when someone else and said, of, of, "Of all the things I can't stand, I can't stand anarchy," and so he he went and, and took the loyalty oath. And the interesting thing about Dr. Carlisle is that when he died, according to David Duncan Wallace, the black community lined the street to to honor his passing. Because Dr. Carlisle was considered to be the most moral South Carolinian of his age, and he was also, at least according to Wallace noted to be anti-Jim Crow, which is the other thing that makes this case sort of interesting. Did he purchase Nancy because she was an aged and burned woman who needed a place to stay? Um, or was he simply engaging in the common practice of the middle of the of middle class white South Carolinians? We don't know, but those are the questions that we're trying to answer. Which brings us then to the the major and most interesting portion of our conversation, questions from the audience or comments. We have quickly establish some baseline facts of what we know about slavery at Wofford College. Are there any questions about the presentation? And if not, then we have some questions for our audience. <laughs> yes, ma'am? Well, I know that you said cotton was not here, per se. That wasn't it. So what did just enter the circuit? Like, what was the... They were growing other crops, uh, corn. Corn was especially popular <coughs> around here, um, and it was more portable, especially once it was um, distilled. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, uh, it would have, slavery would have been growing by the 1850s. I don't remember any of the numbers before 1850. Northern part of the county was much more subsistence economy. Southern part, they were growing some cotton, but also uh, corn and I think even wheat. Uh, and, and food crops. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. So the last question was cost of slavery, because I know you said that, of course, it's middle class. So if you were mm -hmm. lower class, um, were you still enslaved? Was, you, was there a penalty for that, or did you have to buy it? Was there some kind of, any kind of ethic or rule to having ownership of slavery? Of slavery I'm sorry. So we, we do often talk about the, the what, what, what some of the scholars of the Old South talk about, the yeoman farmer, the, the, the plain white folks. The plain folks of the Old South, the white people who did not own slaves. And they, wouldn't have, they would have not owned slaves mostly because they couldn't Conform. afford to, uh, probably not because they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they just simply wouldn't have had enough resources. Um, I think how slavery grew so quickly in South Carolina after the cotton gin, you suddenly in the, the lower, uh, the, the, the coastal plain below Columbia, suddenly was, was really good cotton growing land. And they would acquire a few enslaved persons, uh, clear land, plant more cotton, and with their profits that year would grow more cotton. Dr. Revels would add, would add to that, that that's what was happening in her part of Florida, oh, yeah. uh, a generation later in Mississippi and Alabama. Um, cotton was extraordinarily profitable. Um, colonial South Carolina was a rice growing culture, but uh, antebellum South Carolina was cotton growing. Uh, in, and, and it was gradually moving into the upcountry by the time the Civil War came. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you, you talked about uh, religious culture and institutions and clergy in relation to slavery um, among white people in South Carolina, and of course there were quite a lot of black Christians as well, including black Methodists who were part of a different uh, denomination, at least some of them, mm -hmm. so there's a different institutional presence. And um, you know, how, how does that fit into, when we talk about religious culture in relation to slavery in the, in the South, <clears throat> in terms of this research? I think the the interesting and, and, and I would say even tragic thing, and I can say this more about Methodism, is that early Methodists were, early white Methodists were anti-slavery. John Wesley was anti-slavery. Francis Asbury was anti-slavery. Um, but being anti-slavery in the Carolina Low Country, even by 1800 to 1804, would get you um, uh, perhaps dragged to a pump in a town, and they might try to uh, drown you in the in the in the town well. Uh, that happened to some of uh, Asbury's Methodist clergy in Charleston. They told him after that, "Don't come back to Charleston unless you see fire on the mountain." Um, and 
Asbury finally, and I've heard it said that he said it very dejectedly, he said, I'm called to suffer for Christ, not for slavery. It, the denomination wasn't going to grow among the people they wanted it to grow, these cotton, grow, cotton planters. Many of them weren't Methodists, but some were. They recognized the denomination wasn't going to grow if you cut yourself off. Um, but the Methodists also provided a lot of missionaries to the enslaved persons. A lot of clergy were appointed to the, the enslaved persons' own uh, Colleton Parish or Black River or, or whatever. And they would now they were preaching a gospel that um, was obey your masters, basically uh, yeah. servants obey your masters. Uh, and, and it is interesting because after um, there were black Methodist leaders who left the Methodist Episcopal Church, who went and helped found the AME Church, who went north and got ordained. And um, the church in Charleston, Mother Emanuel, was, uh, was sort of part of that AME community. And then the church was suppressed after the Denmark, D.C. uprising. Can I just ask, um, is your question about how does a religious institution support morally something that mm -hmm. seems immoral? Is, is that where you're going with the question? No, you can answer that if you want. <laughs> I, I'm just interested in how, how we think about this historically, right? We, we sort of think of Whopper as related to a certain kind of, of, um, of class and race-based kind of Methodism, right? And, but that's not the only kind of Methodism mm -hmm. in South Carolina. So you, know, you can go with the other one if you want. Um, One of the things that, now the area that I should just make sure that people know, my area that I know, the stories that I know, are from the Caribbean, from West Africa, uh, to a certain degree actually Canada. Um, this is a lot of what my colleagues here are talking about is something that I don't know nearly as much. What I can tell you is that there are, is a fault line in the 17th century, maybe a little bit here and there, but definitely in the 18th century where you see various Christian, I'm just going to talk about the Western tradition here, various Christian religious groups starting to divide over enslavement. Some of them being very categorical, it is evil, it is an institution which deforms human relations in any way that you can imagine. The Quakers were the very first uh, about a hundred years before this at least, to categorically say, no, enslavement is wrong. Uh, we have early Methodists, as pointed out, mm -hmm. um, who said that, they weren't listened to necessarily. Um, by the end of the 18th century here in the United States, you've got a situation where, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I'm kind of trying to remember some stuff I read kind of a while ago, but there is a severe division in Methodists and in Baptists mm -hmm. over what are uh, over the the white folks who led the churches at that time over what do we do which we're going to have to make a decision here does that help a little bit <clears throat> sure well and I, I guess I'd add as well I'll, I'll talk about the Presbyterians for a minute but because uh, a lot of the, the, the best theolo theological minds uh, a lot of them were Presbyterians. Uh, South Carolina's leading Presbyterian, well, the South's leading Presbyterian theologian was James Hanley Thornwell. Um, and he kind of wrestled with it a little bit and then just decided the Bible doesn't say, doesn't talk about certain things in a way that, that I can understand. So, you know, if Christ wasn't, didn't legislate against it, then the church can't legislate against it. Um, and, and in fact, I a book called The Metaphysical Confederacy really puts a lot of the credit or blame, depending on how you want to put it, on the clergy, the Southern Protestant clergy, for giving support, giving enough cover to the political leadership. He, his argument was you can't have the political confederacy until you have the metaphysical confederacy. They have to have a confederacy of the mind, and they, so that's what makes some of this so hard is that. If, even if there were individuals, uh, white individuals in the South who were anti-slavery, 
You had your whole society telling you, uh, your church was telling you, this is, this is okay, or this is even a positive good. That's what makes this so, I think I'll use Dr. Banks' word, insid I used, like you said, insidious yeah, yeah. earlier. Um, it's like there's this conspiracy for this system. That, that's precisely why I pulled that there from the 1860 Carolina Spartan. It's basically arguing this is a step of civilization. It is necessary. There's a religious base. For those of you who studied the Hamitic curse, or you've looked at these theologians who articulate a theology that says that God cursed all persons of color, or these types of things. So there are all these, uh, there, there, no, there are systems upon systems. But what becomes fascinating, at least for, I'm a European historian by training, the, the Enlightenment abolitionist tradition that comes out of France doesn't work. It fails. The Christian evangelistic tradition that comes out of England with like Granville Sharp and William Wilberforce works. Ultimately, it's a moral call, and that moral transformation is what drives it. I did want to share this with you just for those of you who may not have seen this, this uh, earlier this year. Mm -hmm. The Washington Post has done something extraordinary where they've tracked the 1,700 plus congressmen who owned and who enslaved black people. And so this is something that, again, I would recommend that you look at because this is not just a Wofford question. This is indeed an American question. So Wofford is reflecting a deep-seated contradiction in American ideology about itself. Which leads me to the core question that I want to ask all of you. This is the question that we're asking. And this, there is no right answers, but we're soliciting opinions. How do we wrestle with the fact that people did or believed things that we now find to be morally repugnant, but that were commonly believed in their time period and supported in their time period, how do we judge that? Should we be renaming spaces? How should we approach this? What do, you, what do we think? Well, again, this is a question that we have to wrestle with as a college as we try to go forward. But don't all answer at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tend to be a very opinionated person. And the one thing about history is that it has to be shared, otherwise it's not, it is not relevant, it is not untrue. And if a person during that period of time um, was living according to the common ethos, I believe that we can't change the name of buildings. I think we need a constant reminder of where we come from. And these buildings, these spaces, are uh, named after people who own slaves. I think we need to study who they are study how they got there, try to see what we could do in moving forward in the future. We said we don't wind back in the situation that caused all this to happen in the first place. But I've never been one who believed over this last decade when it was rose to a lot of um, conversation nationally, especially that we should change the names of things. I didn't believe that. And I did believe that we need to take monuments that were done for people who own slaves and money is paid for by the public monies that they should not be on public property. Mm -hmm. I think if you can find a group of people who want to take whatever money they got, whether it's done um, legally, respectfully, whatever, if they want to buy a private piece of property and put a monument up there and not force it on other people, that's one thing. But I look at Carlisle Hall, I look at Whiteman, I look at those places here on Walker campus, including the name of the institution. <laughs> um, and how do you change that? Um, I just think we need to educate people and, and make them come to grips on our shared history mm -hmm. and how we don't wind back up in the same place. And that's scriptural. If you don't, if you don't study your slate, your, your history, you wind up repeating yourself. Mm -hmm. or like that. I think we just study so we don't wind up in the same place again. And we're very close to it, I believe, out of several most recent um, administrations and action. I went back there again. We need to study ourselves and be approved. Thank, thank you. Other comments, please? Can I, can I just like, I, when you, you made such a great point about we need to study our history, so I'd like to toss a question. I know there are some students in the back of the room and maybe listening on Facebook. What would help you? Because one of the things we want to be able to do is bring this knowledge to you, provide this for you. You can tell by tonight's conversation, it's a very complicated subject. How are you most receptive to learning? How, is it more classes? Is it more on social media? Help us, help us figure out how
to reach you in ways that you're willing to, to hear and engage in. So I want to put that to some of my students over here. Yes, sir. I do actually have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I do have a question. Uh, the Underground Railroad, was that, was there any local chapters around here, around Spartanburg? Everybody looks at me, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think escape. Uh, I think escaping from enslavement was probably it was very hard, but it was all because I mean, you think about it. You've got a long way to go from Spartanburg or from the Lower South to get into Pennsylvania before 1850, and then after 1850, you basically got to try to get to Canada. Um, and, and so I, I really don't know. Um, but we do see in the Annabelle newspapers, you frequently see ads for um, my escaped slave, usually with pretty uh, offensive descriptions of the person who, who escaped. Um, but I, I'm not aware around here specifically. But I will, I will add this recent scholarship that suggests that slaves also fled west trying to get to Mexico yeah. before uh, separation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it would be easier to get to old Mexico. Perhaps mm -hmm. you still have a long way to go to get to be emancipated around here. So you'd be better off trying to hide. Yes, but, but Dr. Now, Dr. I don't know about the upstate, but in coastal areas, sailors, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. male, uh, would also. And not using the underground railroad. Maroon communities, too. Oh, or the maroon communities as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and it's also very important to remember, and this is something modern research has shown, is that so many enslaved people who ran away might have only been away for a month, two months. Mm -hmm. They would often be supported by people on their plantations who would bring them food, who would help them hide out. And ultimately, they might come back, not because they wanted to, but because they were hungry, you know, they, they were cold, they were, they missed their families. Mm -hmm. But what they, what they had achieved was a moment of agency. Yep. And that is a very important thing when we're talking about slave, I always sort of divide up in class between rebellion, we think of Nat Turner or something like that, mm -hmm. but resistance can mm -hmm. be everything from running away for two or three weeks to breaking some tools to just not working like mm -hmm. the enslaver wants you to. And those are important things to mm -hmm. see because that asserts the humanity of those people who are called mm -hmm. Are there any additional, yes? I was going to um, respond to Dr. Revel's um, question. I think we really need more classes like on the slave experience that is not just for history majors or people that are interested in history because I graduated high school four years ago in taking your class, the, um, the Gen Ed Revel uh, U.S. History. What I learned about slavery was still, even though I'm only, this is four years ago, I was in high school, was vastly different mm -hmm. than I learned in high school. And then after learning that, <clears throat> learning what we learned in your class, I was kind of like shocked, but also like disappointed that it's so, like what I learned in that is so different than what we learned in like the public school system. So I don't know if this changed a lot in four years, the curriculum or what teachers teach, but I think that more people should have to take or learn about slavery the way you taught it because it is, it is so different than what I learned. And I, it might just be like a South Carolina education curriculum. I don't know if it's the same in more uh, progressive areas, but I do think we need more classes, I don't know if forced classes or obligatory mm -hmm. classes would like yeah. lessen the appeal, but some way bridge the gap from what we don't learn or the lack of information that we learn in high school versus what you learn in higher education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And High school fourth, teachers have hard, hard jobs. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, with the anti CRT bills, everything mm -hmm. that relates to the black harder. experience is now labeled critical race theory. So mm -hmm. it, we, we hyperbolically say that it's soon going to be illegal to teach black history, but in some states, it's going to be very close. Yes? Um, I think that in a lot of ways, students are typically coddled when they're taught. And actually, not students, Americans are coddled when they're taught mm -hmm. history. 
especially white Americans, in a sense that like it, we we study these things as though people didn't live them, mm -hmm. and I think that giving first-hand documents is a huge way to actually like, and that's I think that's really cool about archival research. Um, it makes me think of like, for example, I've read um, the Thinking Men in class, mm -hmm. and there's a line that like I'll never forget like these enslaved people had to build blackboards in classrooms that they knew they'd never sit in. And that's like, wow. Um, so I think that, I think that, I think that teachers need to treat students with more maturity in the fact that students are adults and they need to deal with history. Again, maybe I'm being tough, but um, sometimes it's frustrating just to see people kind of brush past these things. And then also, as far as like a society and like thinking about renaming things, I think we need to rethink how we think about our heroes. Because typically when you crit critique somebody that is historical, people say but, or but they did this. When in reality it's like and. Mm -hmm. And people are more neutral than good or bad. And there's a lot of bad people too. So I don't know, I think that we need to rethink that as well. We do have. Oh, so. We have, do have a comment from Facebook with someone saying that we should contextualize our history by perhaps placing placards on each of the buildings about the named person that would help bring attention to and recognize and acknowledge the past and honor those whom they enslaved. Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to say I mean, listening to you, um, understanding that slaves were nothing more than property, just like cattle. Uh, you guys were saying that it was their status of how many slaves you had, depending on your status, if you had a large number, then, you know, you had pretty high status. Uh, but what was interesting to me is kind of getting back to where there's no documentation. I, I wonder if those things were purged on purpose to kind of cover families, to say that, hey, my family wasn't this, or if it's simply, I'm not going to document what my chicken is doing in the backyard. You know, those things are important. And then getting to the buildings, I, it depends. Because if I was a kid and I was going to a school called Robert E. Elementary, then I identified that as an adult, who he was, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to be there. So you have to be careful about who, who you're studying. And when you learn that history, you know, then, then it's important. So some of the, some things should be in the museum, and then some of those things could remain the same. But I think it depends on the person. Yeah, I have a question about the young. <laughs> it's always been my experience going through life that we only have one percent of the people in this country who own anything, and they share that among themselves before they share with anybody. Um, Drifting down. I, it's always been my experience coming through life that the worst races, the worst people are the ones who don't have anything. The young ones of our world. And I think the worst thing about our society where we don't change anything is that the legislators are afraid of reparations. They really can wrap their heads around the fact that you can't make everything better with money. We gotta go back and see what we can do by changing some of the ideas that have been implanted in people's minds over the years. And the ones that I think you would today who support critical race theory are the ones who don't own anything. I don't use a curse word, but you're not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> they don't own anything, and they're the ones who are the worst providers. And the ones who try to uphold the system the most, they don't, they, they don't own anything. They didn't own anything. Their grandparents didn't own slaves. And they were afraid of the system because the slaves' owners could have put them out of business at any time and bought everything they had. And so I just think we should study history to find out who did what, who had what. Because the greatest thing you can have is an educated mind to understand and appreciate our history. And again, I still say it's a shared history. You cannot carve out one part of people, whether they were enslaved or not, and the contributions they made. Just as, as um, 
Dr. Pruitt suggested maybe we just add on a plaque. Why don't we just name some buildings after some people and make it parity and try to get this thing straightened out? Um, that, that's just my opinion. I, I, don't, I don't own that design. <laughs> well, I, I will say that m much of the scholarship since the 80s about whiteness does, in fact, wrestle with why certain people embraced racism. And a lot of that scholarship suggests that the poorer you were, the more likely you were to become racist because you were using your race to separate you from people who were in the same class mm -hmm. position that you were in. Uh, wages of whiteness does that. Uh, there's a historian who wrote an interesting article called Possessive Investment in Whiteness. There's a reason that you wanted to be white because it gave you status you otherwise didn't have. So that's something that we have tried to wrestle with in, in scholarship since the 80s. I think more people need to be familiar with that. I think it, it, act, it asks and answers some interesting questions. See, you should have been a historian. <laughs> well, I just always, my favorite movie that comes on at 2 o'clock in the morning is Gone with the Wind. Because when that man found out that he didn't own nothing, <laughs> and he was white, and most of the Negroes are other words they use with, with double um, confidence, um, he began to see that he was not on the level of most of the people that he thought were enslaved people. They were more educated. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you could learn a lot sitting in the back of the master's house. Who wrote that book called The Spook Who Sat By The Door? Sam Greenlee. Thank you. We, we have more educated people among our race because of the associations. And they could have, input. half of the slaves could have been college professors because they learned to read. They cut their hands on Bibles. Um, it didn't take, it did not take um, a system. The system was there, it was just not enunciated and enumerated. And in South Carolina, after emancipation by 1868, once they were able to actually participate in politics, South Carolina's State House of Representatives was a majority black legislative body. That's right. There were a number of, the first, the first black member of the United States Congress was a South Carolinian. Uh, Joseph Rainey. Well, so, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try. That's, uh, we are, we've exceeded our time. If there are any final questions, we'll be happy to take them. Yes, ma'am. It's for you. Tell yes, me, Tell me what will happen when you drug out Nancy is. Like, what is the reward? Is it that you will know about maybe her ancestry here, her lineage? Will you know more about the owner? Will you find, I just want to know what Nancy's solution is. I want to know who the one woman whose name we have, what we can know about her. I want to know where she came from. I want to know how she ended up in Spartanburg, and I want to know where she's buried. Okay. That's my. That's what I want to know. But that woman's body is somewhere, and I want to know where she died. And that's my ultimate motivation. Yes, we will find out something about James Carlyle because there's reason to believe that James Carlyle may have been doing a, the only act of charity he could because he could. She couldn't be freed. Right. So. So okay. we don't know. We don't. We don't know where she ended up. So that's why the question. Uh, Dr. Rosen and Lisa. I was just going to say, I would assume also to add to yours, to know her as a human being. Mm -hmm. Simply to know her as a human being. And that is important and that matters. And, we have, and she has a name. And she has mm -hmm. a name. Has Out of all name. those other slaves, she has a, why did she right. have a name? That's right. the humanity of all of it. Yes, mm -hmm. and I want to know if there's possible roots here. If she has children. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Family. family. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Okay. And you're going to get the last question. Well, I, I don't really have a question. I'm just really a asking. I know that this has been wonderful information, great information. And I know that we were sensitive to the time. I'm just wondering, Dr. Pruitt, can we, can we just have a, a moment for, um, uh, for Mr. Mr. Cheek and Ms. Felicia Plant just to say something? Sure. Well, absolutely, if, if you like, but before we do that, I do want to say this. At the end of the day, any conversation about slavery at Wofford College is not about the people who held slaves. The, the question is about the thinking men who built the old main, the women who worked in kitchens, the people who actually performed those services. So I wanted to end our portion of this conversation by reminding us that whatever debate we decide about the names on buildings, this is not a subject of owners. This is the subject of the people that they own and yet still survived. Yes, you have the floor. I, I didn't actually want the floor. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have the floor. Mr. Cheeks. 
I think but that I, it is only fitting. I, I tend to talk too much. I'm <laughs> full circle what, here. What I'll do is I'll just keep it very brief, very well. Thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing us to come today and share some of the things we've been blessed with. Um, this, um, and part of it has been because of our walk of tradition. Mm -hmm. Now, part of my family was educated at South Carolina State University, and the other part was educated at Spelman. They got a whole lot more money than we walk graduates have. <laughs> but um, I just share that very seriously to say, Thank you. Those of you who know history know that what we've talked about here tonight is a bit, a very common things, very common things uh, in the minds of all people, common things we share, common experiences that we've shared as a people moving forward in South Carolina and in the South and in this country. But one of the visitors to this very campus, I understand, is someone who came from a history of slavery. That's Dr. George Washington Carver. And I was blessed to go to a school uh, that was named after him here in this community. And he said this, I want you to take it with when you leave tonight, that when you do a common thing of life in an uncommon way, you command the attention of the world, and that is called excellence. For walk with students, walk with graduates, walk with faculty, walk with alumni, let us keep this conversation going. Let us not shut down because we feel offended by something somebody else said. Let's keep an open mind. Let's become truly educated and experienced, and let's change the world. And that's called excellence. Thank you. Thank you. We do want to remember that the research team did produce this excellent report. If anyone would like a copy of Acknowledging the Race, we have several copies down front. We encourage you to take one and we'll bring one to you. Uh, if there are no additional comments or questions, again, thank you to the fam and Cheek family. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for participating in this event. And I will let you know, for those of you, if I can get a cheap plug, next Monday is our last Black History Month event and our first Women's History Month event. We're having a conversation about bell hooks and black feminism. Oh, so we yeah. hope that you all will come out next Monday night, same time in this location. Again, thank you all very much and have a great night.